the new left's approach to quote Zionism end quote by Jean Amory published in 1969 in this context unlikely as it may be the word Zionism simply cannot do without the quotation marks even in the title because the left by which I mean the new left or for the old left seems to be pretty much at a loss as to how to deal with this entire issue has managed to de-define if the expression be permitted the actual concept of Zionism whom does this new left consider a quote Zionist end quote in the first instance there are obviously more or less all the inhabitants of the state of Israel with the exception of a handful of tiny sects who while living in and because of the political entity that is Israel, fight it, be it like Yuri Avneri, in the name of a, quote, Semitic region, end quote, or in the name of some global revolutionary dream. Yet for the new left, all those diaspora Jews who care about the continued existence of the Israeli state, and I personally know none who do not sympathize with this country, are also Zionists, be they Baron Guy de Rothschild, an obscure Jewish community official, a concentration camp survivor, or a Soviet Jew who would emigrate to Israel if only one would let him. In short, the New Left Zionism, excuse me, in short, for the New Left, Zionism is roughly what, in Germany, some 30 years ago was called quote, world Jewry, end quote. Leftist purism, leftist zeal, and leftist virtuousness, in Robespierre's sense, remonstrate against this, this Zionism, which leftists also like to call, quote, national Zionism, end quote, in order to align it phonetically with national socialism. In Israel, the left sees the aggressor and oppressor, the armor bearer of Western American imperialist Im oppression. In the Israeli army, it sees a quote, army with a state, end quote, a formulation once used to describe the Prussian military. When it looks at Israel, it sees the ugly traits of militarism, if not of fascist violence. As a matter of course, its sympathies go out to the Arab Fry Corps especially the al -Fata. For the left, he bears the steely and transfigured face of the resistance fighter. How, one wonders, did it come to this? What did it take for the global left? I repeat, for the purposes of this discussion, by left I mean the new left, to embrace a hatred of Israel that, if left to run its course, of this much I am sure, can only serve the evil and unjust scourge of anti-Semitism. How did Marxist dialectical thought come to lend itself to the preparation of the coming genocide? All this raises more questions than I can treat here, and the answers I offer can only be rough and approximate. In the first instance, one needs to address an issue that hitherto has not received sufficient attention, because for our leftist interlocutors, it is a conceptual taboo, the generational problem. Those of us who belong to the old left should not forget that the new left is only new in theoretical terms. It is also young. Those active in the new left tend to be somewhere between 18 and 28 years of age. For them, the Nazi catastrophe is truly history, an event tailing off into some historical twilight zone just as distant as, say, the French Revolution. Not that the young leftists do not know about Nazism. After all, in historical terms, they also know about the French Revolution. In their struggle against the NPD, NPD is the acronym for the far-right National Democratic Party of Germany, founded in 1964, They have demonstrated clearly and in most gratifying manner 
that they are willing to stand by their convictions when the danger of fascism rears its head. And yet they are oblivious to a number of phenomena specific to German National Socialism which the concept of fascism fails to encapsulate. The firestorm unleashed on the Jews between 1939 and 1945 in particular, they know about only from hearsay. They were not there when the neighbor, Mr. Schlesinger, was taken from his apartment along with his family and brought somewhere unpleasant. They did not attend the Allied Occupation Forces screenings in 1945 of films showing, quote, German atrocities, end quote. They entered a world that, as they saw it, offered them a clean slate, and their conscience is clear. This allows them to understand, quote, Nazi fascism, end quote, by misunderstanding it. They are separated from it by a shock-absorbing historical space filled with illustrated broadsheets on which General Dayan may indeed look like Field Marshal on which General Dayan may indeed look just like Field Marshal Kesselring. Footnote. Albert Kesselring, 1885-1960, was a highly decorated Field Marshal of the Luftwaffe, the aerial warfare branch of the German Wehrmacht during World War II. Kesselring commanded air forces in the invasion of Poland and France, the Battle of Britain, and the invasion of the Soviet Union. End footnote. Yet, one cannot understand the phenomenon of Israel without being fully cognizant of the Jewish catastrophe. Metaphorically speaking, everyone in Israel is the son or grandson or somebody who is gassed. By contrast, in Germany and in the rest of Europe, one can take the liberty of being neither a, quote, son, end quote, nor a, quote, grandson, end quote. For the new left, every hour is the zero hour, every day a new beginning. Yet the Jews, to use Hoffmannsthal's words, can, quote, never cast from their eyelids the lassitudes of long-forgotten peoples, end quote neither in Israel nor elsewhere. Footnote. This is a quotation in the translation of Vernon Watkins from Hugo von Hoffmannsthal's well-known poem Manche Freilich, Many Truly, published in 1896. End of footnote. For every Jew is and will continue to be for a long time to come on one of those death marches the evacuated Jewish concentration, concentration camp inmates were forced to undertake in the spring of 1945. The New Left does not understand that Israel can still be understood only against the bleak backdrop, against this bleak black backdrop, and that it will continue to be this way for some decades to come. How can one impress on the young that Israel is no country like any other? It is a sanctuary for deeply exhausted survivors and victims of persecution. Fair enough, I hear people object, but of what concern is this to the Palestinian Arabs, who have themselves been expelled from their house and home, even though they were not the ones who killed the Jews by the millions? This question, as a point of argument, is indeed difficult to answer. Should one point out that the Arab refugees, with a modicum of goodwill on the part of the Arab states, could have found refuge there, while all doors were closed to the Jews from Hitler, excuse me, while all doors were closed to the Jews whom Hitler persecuted and threatened with murder? This is not a particularly strong or compelling response, I know. Yet even if one allows for the consideration that Palestine may not have been the right place for the establishment of a Jewish state, the fact remains that the state of Israel now exists. It was created with just as much legitimacy under international law as any other. 
one cannot deliver the human beings who now live in this state to opponents who would clearly take no prisoners, no matter what the Arab propaganda abroad may claim. Which brings us to the tragedy of Israel, Israeli aggression. To deny it would be simply nonsensical. Yet Israel attacked first, both in the Suez campaign and in the Six-Day War. Excuse me. Yes, Israel attacked first, both in the Suez campaign and in the Six-Day War. In the Gaza Strip, on the West Bank, and the Sinai Peninsula, Israel is the occupying power, bringing with it all that being an occupying power implies, that an occupier, any occupier, is invariably also an oppressor goes without saying. To be sure, according to the unanimous testimony of more or less the entire world press, Israel operates in a relatively humane manner in the territories it has occupied, but she cannot escape the fundamental mechanism of violence and counterviolence. Arab guerrillas throw bombs. Israeli soldiers and policemen arrest, destroy structures with explosives, and expel. Even so, the question must surely be permitted whether Israel, in the situation in which it found itself, could have done anything other than attack and occupy territory. This, however, is of no concern to the new left. In a frightening act of crass oversimplification, the lines are clearly and irreversibly drawn in their mind. The Arab freedom fighter, on the one hand, is neatly pitted against the Israeli oppressor, on the other. The simplifying taxonomy driving their ideas and activities has its roots in the myth of the liberation struggle that is both social revolutionary and national in character. Lest I be misunderstood, I hasten to add, I would not dream of dismissing the social revolutionary national liberation struggle per se as a myth. In many locations the world over, it is an equally bitter and justified reality. When Ben Bella readied himself in 1954 to strike against French colonialism, he was by no means beholden to the same mythical idea. Whatever became of Ben Bella, I wonder, and why do we no longer see any of the chefs historiques of the Algerian Revolution? Neither Franz Fanon, the theoretician of national revolutionary force, nor Regis de, Regis de Bray, who sacrificed his freedom to the revolution, nor, needless to say, Che Guevara or Ho Chi Minh are, or were, proponents of a myth. Violent revolution turns to myth only where, for good reasons, it cannot and will not take place. In West Berlin, Frankfurt, Cologne, Paris, Grenoble, and so on. Here, the armed rebellion, in the name of human emancipation, has become a petrified myth and aestheticized slogan. Given the integral role of the national revolutionary insurrection in young leftist thought, or lack thereof, the enthusiasm of the new left inevitably had to coalesce around the resistance of the Palestinian Arabs, thus igniting their animosity towards the Israeli, quote, oppressor, end quote. Vietnam, the struggle of the Bolivian guerrillas, the resistance movement in Greece, the Black Panth Panther movement, the El Fata, they all suddenly become indistinguishable. Am I suggesting that the resistance of the Fedayeen lacks all legitimacy. Of course not. Those who sneak through the Israeli lines and drawing on the rules of the Maki challenge a relatively powerful occupying power are not all blindly indoctrinated fanatics. Some of them are brave men. Footnote. guerrillas fighting in the French resistance during World War II or against the Franco regime in Spain. Oh shit, there was another footnote. Um, 
God damn it. Oh, the Fayadeen. Okay, the Fayadeen is... Are Arab guerrillas operating especially in Israel and the Palestinian territories? And the Maquis are the guerrilla fighters in the French resistance during World War II or against the Franco regime in Spain. Okay, sorry about that. Yet, only those oblivious to history can refuse to recognize that the Israelis, too, are engaged in a struggle for national liberation, and that this struggle is inordinately more dangerous and inordinately more tragic than that of the Palestinian Arabs. For here, sheer survival is at stake, and the preservation of a shelter for the Jews of the diaspora who are just about still tolerated in the developed countries and would long since have perished under dramatic circumstances in the Arab states had they not been able to seek refuge in Israel. Israel is fighting for the life of each of her inhabitants. The Arabs, by contrast, are fighting for their territorial rights. There can surely be no doubt that a left that has not succumbed to myth should at least try not to pour oil on into the fire in the form of its ill-thought-out anti-Israelism. The young leftists will surely reject with disdain the suggestion that their anti-Zionism incorporates elements of crude anti-Semitism, and quite rightly so. I would not accuse any of those young people who do no more than boo or shout down an Israeli ambassador of personally nurturing anti-Semitic intentions. Yet, our young would-be Marx experts should surely know, given the objective historical situation, individual intentions and goals as such count for little. The seedbed in which the young left operates with its anti-Zionist furor, excuse me, fur, not fewer, fewer. Sorry. The seedbed in which the young left operates with its anti Zionist furor nurtures the sprouts of a centuries old anti Semitism, which has been anything but, quote, mastered, end quote. Somewhere, every, quote, down with the Zionist oppression, end quote, finds an echo sounding remarkably like, quote, perish Judah, end quote. The anti-Semitism aroused long ago, presumably by the fallacious notion of the deicide, is as virulent as ever in the collective subconscious of the European peoples. In the anti-Zionism of the young left, it finds not only a well-functioning outlet, but supposedly also an alibi. After all, the Jews have always had to play the boogeyman, the global foe, Little wonder, then, that they are once again being stigmatized as oppressors. Hence my contention that left-wing anti-Zionism must and will merge into the generalized anti-Semitism that is in the air, and which is in any case not without precedent on the left, unless the new left repents at the eleventh hour, shakes off its guerrilla metaphysics, and finally, just for once, does what it constantly claims, on every suitable and unsuitable occasion to be doing, namely to, quote, reflect, end quote, intellectually on a given situation. I would not want to draw my discussion to an inevitably premature close without pointing to one final and decisive fact. The anti-Zionism of the left is driving the overwhelming majority of the Jews in Europe and the United States who, with considerable justification, feel constantly endangered, into the arms of the reactionaries. Much of the Jews suffering under the official anti-Semitism of the states of the Warsaw Pact most likely. I have no reliable information on this issue at my disposal and can only speculate and infer. View the United States as some sort of promised land. So too, if the young left continues to insist on its pro-Arab Manichaeism, which is a stark division between good and evil, I'm pretty sure is the most simple definition of Manichaeism, the genuinely progressive and liberal-minded Jew in Western Europe 
and the United States will, in the long run, show a tendency to become affiliated with conservative movements who do not oppose Israel. I simplify slightly to drive home the point. Should George Bidal one day really emerge as Israel's last friend, all those radical leftist French Jews who support the FLN would, la mort dans la haine, from one day to the next cling to Bidal. I could add some German examples, but cannot overcome my reluctance to mention specific names in this context. Oh, look, there's a bunch of footnotes here. Footnote 1. The Front de Libre Région Nationale. National Liberation Front was the principal nationalist movement during the Algerian War. Um, the Mort dans la M is pronounced is uh, a translation of with a heavy heart. And the final one is footnote says in nineteen sixty one Georges Bidal 1899 to 1983, who had in earlier years served as foreign and defense minister under de Gaulle, called for violent resistance against the Algerian national movement, both in Algeria and in mainland France, and denied the legitimacy of de Gaulle's government. Bidal went underground and fled the country in 1962. He returned to France in 1968 after the authorities had suspended their arrest warrant against him. End of footnotes. Nobody expects the young left to define itself in relation to, quote, world Jewry, end quote. Nobody, least of all I, who always assumed I was closely aligned to the left, to the young left, demands that it take a pro-Jewish or pro-Israel position in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This historical tragedy without precedent. All I ask for is a minimum of goodwill and a basic sense of justice in its political judgments. Is it really that difficult to recognize that the generals of the Israeli army are no Westmorelands? Footnote. General William Westmoreland 1914 to 2005, was the commander in charge of U.S. military action in Vietnam from 1964 to 1968. End footnote. Can one seriously liken the Israeli soldiers to the heroes of Lydice and Arador? Footnote. In 1942, following the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, the Germans raised the Czech village of Lydice, murdering the inhabitants on the spot or sending them to Chelmno extermination camp. In 1944, the Germans entirely destroyed the French village of arador sur -Glain. Most of its inhabitants, including the women and children, were massacred by the Waffen SS. End footnote. Finally, is it really that much of an intellectual stretch to see that a game is being played out between the two superpowers in the Middle East, in which Israelis and Arabs alike are mere pawns? Does it take a genius in sociology or political studies to understand that anti-Zionism gives anti-Semitism the inch that the whole mile will invariably have to follow? A pinch of common sense should suffice. One should not resign oneself to the notion that the young left has exchanged that pinch for unthinking dialectical phraseology and streamlined werewolf romanticism.